It struck me as we were going through the circle and I'm listening to these kids and parents just be so sincere and talk about the ways that they were hurt and why they did what they did and how they wanted things to be different. I realized, whoa, no one is being leveraged to be here. Everyone is choosing to be here because they recognize the importance of these connections. Everyone is a deeply committed stakeholder to this situation. I was so moved by it. I want to do work like this where everyone wants to be in this space, where everyone's choosing to be here. So it took a couple of years to kind of go from that breakthrough revelation to creating this model, but I realized that there was sort of a niche out there that no one was filling, no one was applying restorative principles to intimate relationships as far as I had seen. I thought, this is a great model for creating safe containers for conflict, and Lord knows people need it in these, these circumstances. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. Whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we are joined by Jessica Fern and Dave Cooley to talk about their new book, Polywise. To check out our first episode that featured Jessica, listen way back to episode 291, where we talked about her first book, Polysecure. So, quick introductions Jessica Fern is a psychotherapist, coach, and certified clinical trauma professional. Jessica is the author of Polysecure Attachment, Trauma, and Non Monogamy, which I know. Many of our listeners have already read and also the author of the Polysecure Workbook, Healing Your Attachment and Creating Security in Loving Relationships, and now Polywise, A Deeper Dive into Navigating Open Relationships. Jessica also works with individuals, couples, and people in multi-partner relationships who no longer want to be limited by their reactive patterns, cultural conditioning, insecure attachment styles, and past traumas. And David Cooley is a professional restorative justice facilitator, diversity and privilege awareness trainer, and bilingual cultural broker. He's the creator of the Restorative Relationship Conversations model, which is a process that transforms interpersonal conflict into deeper connection, intimacy, and repair. He specializes in working with non-monogamous and LGBTQ partnerships, incorporating a variety of modalities, including trauma-informed care, attachment theory, somatic practices, narrative theory, and mindfulness-based techniques. And then, of course, it wouldn't be complete without saying that we also have a book which just came out recently, which is Multi-Amory, Essential Tools for Modern Relationships. So I'd say really just by all the books I've listed, you should go get them all. <laughs> It covers some of our most used communication tools, and you can find out about that at multiamory.com slash book. And at the end of the episode, we'll give you links where you can go to get books from Jessica and David. So Jessica and David, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Oh my gosh, it's just been a real pleasure to go back and read this book again this week. I was lucky to get an advanced reader copy, but then I also got to go back and read it again this week. And there's so many incredible nuggets of wisdom and education sprinkled all throughout. And I wanted to start off for both of you to talk to us about how Polywise came to be and sort of its relationship to your other book, Polysecure. I originally thought this would be my first book because I had a talk that I was sort of you know, bringing around to different conferences that was based on my research with clients and qualitative research that I was doing of sort of trying to answer this question of why are people struggling with the opening up process or people who have been non-monogamous for so long, they're coming in with these big hurdles and challenges. And my publisher, though, initially was like, well, can you do a whole book of attachment instead of what would have been a chapter on attachment? And we did Polysecure first. And so then, David, how did you get on the bandwagon with this project? Well, she, as she started to, to get into it, it became clear that the work that I was doing complemented sort of the, the work that she was, you know, kind of the things that she was wanting to highlight for, for clients. I mean, we work with a very similar demographics. And so we were just seeing a lot of parallels in the things that we were noticing in the conversations we were having about the work before she was even writing the book. 
So I think it was also something that we had wanted to do for a long time. We were actually intending to collaborate on our first book and then we just weren't in the place to do that in terms of our relationship. We were, you know, fresh in kind of the divorce phase and and really apart and not really there was no intimate connection at that point. I think it just became kind of clear. I mean, you could say more, Jess, of what your thinking was, why you brought me on. Yeah, because there is sort of a whole section for me of people. One of the challenges they face is all of this old conflict that hasn't been dealt with in their relationship. And so it really felt like Dave's work was the answer and needed a chapter in and of itself. And then as I was writing, as we were writing, there was just a lot more story, personal story that we wanted to add in this book. And it felt great, I think, to have us sort of share a bunch of our hardships through this process. Yeah. So I know it's interesting because the three of us have, you know, earlier this year also went through the whole gamut of doing like book promotion interviews and talking about our collaborative relationship together. And in the history of the three of us, we also have a history of, you know, like being in a quad together, then a triad, then the triad breaking up and stuff like that. And so, of course, everyone wants to know, oh, my God, how did you get through that? So I am curious. I know you touched on it in the book a little bit, but, you know, what was the most important things for the two of you to do to shift your relationship to enter that place where you could collaborate on something like this? Because I do think for a lot of people, the idea of being able to write a book with their ex or produce a podcast with their ex is just unthinkable. She was asking for me to collaborate on that first book. I think she was in a very different place in our divorce process and I actually needed space and I think uh, it took about a year where we were living across town. We were in Boulder, Colorado. We were living on opposite sides of town and really just connecting around the logistics of picking up and dropping off our son. And so I was really just needing to heal and go through a lot of the attachment separation stuff, figuring out kind of what was my part, what was my stuff to owe. And I went through a lot of deep personal work after our separation, which is really, really helpful. I wasn't able to do that in the context of intimacy with Jess. And then after about a year or so, it just started feeling kind of natural, you know, in those pickups and drop offs with our son, we just, I would linger longer. She would linger. I'd start to be more curious about what was going on for her intimately. And, you know, she was, she was in a relationship that was getting more serious. It was a live in relationship at that point, hanging out, having dinner, getting to know him more. Uh, and then the pandemic hit. And we were all ready for a change. We needed to pivot pretty dramatically to protect our son from being in a situation that felt like wasn't going to really work for him or be sustainable for us. I had always wanted to get out of the country and go to Latin America. And so we found an opportunity to go to Costa Rica and we jumped on it. We all went together and we ended up living in a house together, all four of us, right out of the box for about, I don't know, what was it? Three months, three, four months, Jess? Mm -hmm. wow, something like that in this tiny little two bedroom cabana. And yeah, this I mean, it was lovely. tiny in the, in the rainforest of Costa Rica. And it just really threw us back into a very intimate dynamic that really felt pretty easeful, at least between me and at you, At least Jess, for us. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Right. It brought us back together, you know, our co-parenting, co-authoring and living in the same house. That's amazing. So brought back together in a romantic sense or brought back together in more of we're co-parenting and co-living and existing together as friends and all of the great things that happen from being in relationship. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, for years, we were really good friends for six years before we were together for 10 years. So the foundation yeah. has always been this really deep friendship and love as humans for each other. And after we got divorced in that year, we did like an unvowing and released our wedding mm -hmm. vows. And then we revowed and we revowed to each other as co-parents and as basically attachment humans. Like I've got your back in this life and you've got your name. And that was really powerful, I think, for, for both of us. Yeah, there's there's kind of been a, a karmic connection. I mean, it really does. Of all the relationships, it really feels very karmic. I was just going to say, I really appreciate, I remember our first conversation uh, when we had you on the show, Jessica, how it really helped to clarify this really good language around the relationships around us about whether we make someone into an attachment figure or not. And I know that sometimes we struggle in the non-monogamous community wanting to reject this traditional language around like, oh, is this relationship quote unquote serious or not? Or is it, I don't know, romantic or is it emotional, right? And there are so many of these really wonderful relationships that don't quite yeah. fit any of those labels. 
But looking at it through the lens of attachment makes it make perfect sense, mm. at least to me. And so I really, I really appreciate that in that conversation. I feel like that light bulb really switched on for me. I like the label you use right now of just attachment humans. Yeah, there's something interesting for me. I think, I don't know that we would have, I don't know what it would have happened if we hadn't had a child in the mix. But the commitment to be co-parents was really a glue that kept us through some really rough moments. You know, I can imagine my own attachment system sort of wanting to do the avoidant, see you later, you know, kind of a thing after the separation because of the pain. But I'm really glad that that was the case, that we did have a child in the mix, that we were committed to co-parenting and we put him first. Because now I really am seeing sort of kind of what you were alluding to, Dedeker, is that there's, there is something, there's something really rich there now that I think I only understand after the fact, which is a level of commitment that has nothing to do with romance and everything to do with just what does it mean to have someone's sort of best interest at heart and feel connected to them. And just, there's just something about that connection I would have had no understanding of if we hadn't gotten to this point. Even as you said exes, right, for you all to consider each other exes when you've probably spent so much more time in a different configuration that's more salient than calling each other exes. Right? So it's interesting how people want a central mm -hmm. phrase, right, that that's what's most important. Yeah, 100%. I was with Jace in a monogamous relationship and then a non-monogamous relationship, but we have been out of relationship for far longer than we were in one. So I am trying to shift my narrative around like these two people were my exes, are my exes, to more like they're two of my deepest, closest relationships in my life and two of my best friends and two people that, you know, I have a lifelong connection with because I think that is more powerful and more important for sure. Can we compare notes on how the co-authoring process specifically went for the two of you. I know I learned a lot when the three of us had to suddenly co-author, and I was really grateful that the three of us already had this history of, you know, producing a podcast together and running a business together for many, many years. And so that did help us. But when it came to the actual co-authoring process, I still had a lot of lessons to learn and a lot of my own control freak shit to work out. So <laughs> I just want to hear what your experience was like. I think it went overall pretty well, actually, because we had done some other writing projects previously. And I think we had worked out the kinks in that we just knew how to work together. We knew what our strengths were. We knew what to highlight for each other. And so overall, I think it actually went pretty smooth. You know, we nice. drove each other nuts with certain over word usages that each of us fall into. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Very yeah, familiar, had that. Very familiar yeah. with this. Yes. yes. I think it's, you know, it's, you're working with the author of a highly successful book. It's, it's easy to lean in and trust her and, and default to, to kind of her voice in some places and just be like, she knows what she's doing. But I think even more than that, creatively, there's a way in which I appreciate the way that she thinks. You know, I like the, the way that she fills out ideas. I like what she brings to my writing. I have a very academic kind of drier voice and Jess is, is really, I think does well with, humanizing that. And so I really get a lot out of working with her in collaboration. So I, we sort of went through that initiation, that gauntlet of ego threshing early on. And so I was able to see like, okay, this is where the ego shows up in writing. And I, I definitely relate to that idea of control. Um, and so going into this ahead of time, knowing that we just needed to really not have that be upfront was, was helpful. Yeah. Having that little bit of experience first can go a long way. Let's move on to talking about some of the content in the book here. I think, why don't we start off with this first chapter? Yeah, I, I felt as though in your last book, clearly attachment theory was the, the thread that held the whole book together, and specifically attachment theory within non-monogamy. But this book very much is about paradigm shifts, and that's sort of what the first chapter in the book is all about. These paradigm shifts that occur when you have to change your ideas around what relationships look like, and especially moving from a paradigm of monogamy into non-monogamy. So can you talk a little bit about what paradigm shifts even are, and then also what they may look like in this context? So, you know, we're referencing Kuhn's words and work around just using the phrase paradigm and paradigm shifts. And so paradigms would be sort of a synonym for our worldview, 
the lens that we look through the world with from everything though, right? Not just our like personal philosophy, like how we are, who we are, what we think is okay and not okay. And in the, the chapter, we even get down into some of that nitty gritty of how paradigms can even shape our actual perception, like at a biological level, right? Or our physiology of what we're actually aroused by. You know, it's not something to be underestimated, making a paradigm shift, right? The whole way that you experience the world, yourself and others is a pretty seismic thing to even start to contemplate for one, right? And then start to make a shift. So I really see that in my work with people is this is a big deal to live in a different <laughs> paradigm of yeah. relationship, right? And some of us make that transition quite smoothly and some people do not. And they really actually need help with understanding what they're going through can be a product of what we say is like paradigm shock, you know, similar to culture shock of being in a different country or culture. Um, we can have paradigm shock. I've never heard the term paradigm shock and I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. It makes a lot of sense because it's a similar concept of culture shock shock where just suddenly everything's just a little different from how it was before. But in terms of paradigm shock, like how would you identify that if you were going through it and what mm -hmm. might you do about it? Right. Great question. I mean, and not just sometimes a little different. And I think that shift from monogamy to non-monogamy, we see that most when often in monogamy, the worst, the absolute worst thing that could happen in your romantic relationship is that your partner is with someone else. <laughs> right. And that becomes yeah. this like wired in emotional reactivity, not just a conceptual thing, right? It becomes a fear. And then here out, I'm in a different paradigm that says I'm supposed to celebrate that my partner's with someone else? Like, how do I just do that? How do I just wire myself differently? And I think people, they start to almost feel like queasy. They talk about feeling sick. They talk about not knowing what's mm. right or wrong, like who they are, what they're supposed to do. Dave, you might have some input on this one as well, right? Or a lot of shame even for now the new paradigm that they're trying to step into and there's all of this sort of monogamy hangover right and like inner critic or guilt or shame that's showing up what i see is someone can identify it too as if on one hand they really resonate with the ideas of non-monogamy but then they keep kind of getting pulled back or deferring to very monogamous ways of thinking like but if i was enough then you only would want to be with me that would be an example of a mm. monogamous paradigm thought that people can have this emotional attachment that's hard to you know untie themselves from just identifying that you're going through a paradigm shift that it might be hard and then we give exercises throughout the chapter of having paradigm awareness. What is the paradigm I'm trying to leave from? What's the one I'm trying to shift into? Um, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. There might be some from both paradigms that you want to be living or incorporating. And then just how to work with those. So, yeah, I think the examples that you use of, you know, of course, the, the classic experience of a, mon a previously monogamous couple transitioning into non-monogamy. Mm -hmm. I think it also makes sense where we see people who've been non-monogamous who transition back into monogamy or decide to close their relationship either permanently or temporarily. What are some examples of big paradigm shifts that happen or paradigm shock producing events that happen for people who maybe have been non-monogamous for years already? Yeah. Usually I see it when they've been practicing one style of non-monogamy and then they shift into a different style. Usually that's less hierarchical and more polyamorous. So you'll see people that are like, we've been doing non-monogamy for a decade or more, but I haven't really gone through the threshold of my partner falling in love. And that becomes like a real paradigm shift for them. Yeah. One of the things about that is that it seems like attachment styles or attachment ruptures or or you know, kind of tweaks on the attachment system can really, really feel differently in different styles of non-monogamy. It's been really fascinating to work with clients who, for example, you know, kind of previously had a solo poly sort of trajectory and then meet somebody that really changes that for them. And they take on kind of a primary structure for the first time in their relational history. And it starts to bring up the different feelings around what is attachment in this new context. Whereas in solo for that person, the kind of ways that attachment formed and happened were very, very different and didn't require the same things that it did in the context of a more primary hierarchical relationship. 
So it's really been fascinating to see those and think about it in terms of attachment and how they can be very, very different in the different styles of non-monogamy. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's funny that I think most often we talk about that paradigm shift from someone who kind of like your example, where we were swingers or, you know, doing something and then transitioning to now all these feelings are involved. But I have sometimes seen kind of the other side of that, of maybe we did more of a parallel polyamory where you're doing your thing, I'm doing mine. This is all great. And I'm not, it's not right in front of my face quite as much. And then maybe we switch to more of going to play parties or something where I'm kind of more confronted with it. And that on the other side can also be kind of that jarring, wow, I thought I really had this all figured out, but this is different from what we've been doing for the last 10 years or however long it is. In this, when you're talking about this, you had this interesting term that came up where you talked about creating a temporary vessel to kind of help cope with the the intensity of this <laughs> paradigm shift. Uh, so could you tell us first what that is and, and why did you decide to call it a temporary vessel specifically? Touching on that issue of attachment, you know, it's really what do our attachment systems need to feel safe and secure? And if we're putting that first, which many people are wanting to, sort of the, the really the importance of polysecure was, okay, here is where it feels like our metric is for what nervous systems are needing in making big transitions relationally. And so if we're able to sort of figure out, okay, this is what we're taking care of. We're trying to move forward in a way that's going to preserve as much safety and security moving forward as we can. What is it that we need to do to augment or truncate sort of our relational exploration in a way that keeps that intact? And so we have that concept of titrating, for example. So it's like, okay, we try something and then see how that lands. How are our nervous systems doing with that change? Can we integrate that before sort of moving on to bigger steps? Uh, and so it's sort of giving people permission to try things and move at a pace that sort of is more inclined to support the nervous systems through these bigger changes. So the question I want to ask to that, though, because I know this comes up a lot in the work that I do with clients and I also do somatic work. So like we really dive into titration and how things land and things like that. But when I find that then people are are trying to do that sort of bottom up work of then realizing, OK, now what does this mean for me? I think I've noticed a lot of people really struggle with, OK, well, like I tried something and it it feels kind of scary and a little uncomfortable, but it's really hard to suss out what is my nervous system telling me, oh my God, don't go there at all versus was my nervous system telling me, ooh, this is maybe a little bit risky, but it's ultimately going to be safe. Like I, I do think people sometimes have a hard time sifting out. Mm -hmm. Does this mean it's always going to feel this bad or is it just scary right now? And like, I mean, I'm sure you've encountered that with clients that you've worked with. Yes. <laughs> and so, and that will change too. Like the things that bring you to your edge of your nervous system, right, won't always be the same. And so I make the distinction for people of like, yeah, you're trying new things. It is going to be scary and uncomfortable. That needs to be a new norm for a while, but it shouldn't put you into a trauma response. If you're having primal panic meltdowns, you're having panic attacks, you know, you're like completely off your axis for what you would consider too long. That's telling you your nervous system is way too far. It's breaking instead of bending. So that would be another one of like, mm. you're going to have to bend, but I don't want you to be breaking. And then the other way to work with that is from a parts perspective, what parts of you are afraid? And let's talk to those parts. Let's work with those parts and soothe them, right? And see what that does then to your nervous system to step more into some of these experiences or not. Another thing about that is too, is when people have that conceptual framework of paradigm, this is what you're working with. You're changing this especially in the context of working with parts, when you can connect sort of parts awareness that you're making this paradigm shift, it creates sort of almost like this scaffolding or this bridge conceptually for those parts to sort of even temporarily just adjust themselves to these big changes. It so that it makes it more digestible in some ways, even if it's like, okay, this is feeling right now, this is very acute. This is feeling very activating, but having that paradigm consciousness with the parts work in place I think it, it can help some people integrate it in a way that they wouldn't if they hadn't had that. Hmm. Yeah, your book actually was the first time I believe that I had heard the term parts 
And I, I'm sure that Dedeker has heard it before in all of the work that she's done. But I was well, like, it's originally an IFS thing, right? It was IFS the first. IFS was yeah, not or... the first, but it's the most well known. So can you just for the lay person say what parts is and kind of talk about that in, in the context of the, the book and the work that you do? Yeah, so parts work is looking at how as individuals, as people, we're made up of many different parts, and that's actually normal and healthy. And we kind of intuitively know it when you're like, well, one part of me wants to go and another part of me wants to stay home, right? We have a social party part, and we have a part that just wants to get cozy on the couch. Or we have the part of us that sort of shows up a certain way with one partner or with our children or with our family of origin. And so internal family systems by Dick Schwartz really popularize this aspect of sort of the holistic self, right, that is made up of many parts. Um, But often what happens is certain parts get into these extreme roles, or they're holding wounds, or they're protectors. And so they need to be worked with so that we sort of have more of an integrated system. Well, I'm glad to use that example of, yeah, I have a part of me that wants to go and a part of me that wants to stay. And I think with a lot of people, sometimes it can be there's a part of me that wants to see how this non-monogamous relationship could play out. But there's also a part of me that like really terrified about this and thinks maybe I'll never be able to do this. So, of course, that also leads to the question of when people in relationship are trying to go through some kind of paradigm shift like this and like one person is much more gung-ho about let's shift this paradigm hell yeah and the other person is like oh god you know i'm not really sure that i can do this i mean do you think that finding some kind of compromise there is ever tenable or like do you think that that's something that people can find a way to to meet on or do you think that that should be taken as a sign very early on that like this is probably just not going to work out oh i think it could definitely work You know, and it really just depends on what people are willing to do in terms of modifying their needs and expectations. It just, it also depends on where they are in terms of those kind of possible extreme poles that you just mentioned. Because typically what you're talking about there is sort of a dueling conflict between needs. One person wants autonomy and freedom and the other person's needing more security. And so if you can really start to flush those things out and depersonalize those so that those differences in needs aren't feeling so pathological or charged or problematic in their essence. And so they, okay, yeah, these are things where you're just rooted. This is the exploration you're needing. This, there's nothing necessarily wrong with your positions, but they're there. What are you willing to do in terms of compromise? That's something like a vessel could really be helpful for, for having sort of the person who's needing to explore or try it. But the person who's needing sort of more security and slowness can sort of lean into the structure of the vessel. So I think there's definitely ways to work with it. There are situations where I think that difference will will end up being the end of the relationship. But I think there are a lot of cases where really good compromises emerge and, and people end up surprising themselves. I've been surprised many times by the person who seems like the more reluctant partner compared to their very enthusiastic partner with time and experience they become the one that later then won't even give up (laughs) non-monogamy that you know and the original partner (laughs) wants to yeah yeah so i appreciated in the book also where you said you know it's okay if you go back to monogamy or it's okay if you decide monogamy is actually the thing that's right for me but that you also acknowledged that if your partner finds that it's really not the thing that's okay for them, then perhaps a decoupling in some way does need to happen. And the fact that you put that sort of towards the beginning of the book, I thought was really powerful because so many people are like constantly just trying to fit themselves into a box that doesn't really work. And just being able to read like that permission, I think, from a book that's about non-monogamy and saying it is okay if this isn't what is correct for you, I thought was really powerful. Yeah. And there's this funny thing that happens um, with people who are, you know, newer to non-monogamy is they feel very judged. Um, I shouldn't even say newer. (laughs) I think people feel very judged by non-monogamous people about being monogamous, often as if it's less evolved. And so for me, it's just as valid of a relationship orientation or relationship choice and structure. 
My request, though, is that you're not defaulting into it. You actually have chosen it. That idea that you have choice and it's not like, oh, you've got a choice. You have to take it now. But <laughs> it's kind of the best of both worlds of saying you don't have to just take the one thing that you thought was your only option, but you don't have to take this one other thing. There's a lot of other options out there, right? There's a whole range of different ways you could do it. Or maybe the original thing feels better once you know you're choosing it instead of just, well, this is my only option. Well, I think sometimes having a professional or someone who's sort of in the work give you permission to really make a hard choice really helps and opens up sort of more spaciousness internally to consider it in a new way. So it's like if a professional like Jess or myself is saying to you, yeah, if you need to be monogamous and that's what's best for you, absolutely choose it. Or if this is not the right relationship for you, definitely, we're not here to keep you together. We're here to bring you more clarity around what you're needing as an individual. Sometimes that creates a spaciousness that was necessary for them to sort of lean into the exploration. I mean, that's been an interesting thing is the permission itself sort of can start to create this space internally for something that they were needing before. We're going to take a quick break to talk about how you can support this show. If you appreciate this content and you enjoy being able to have this out there for free and to be able to share it with everyone out there for free, not behind any paywalls, the way you can do that is by taking a moment to listen to our sponsors and check any of them out if they seem interesting to you. And of course, you can support us directly and join our communities by going to multiamory.com slash join. This holiday season, you may be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-repaired, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos. Skip the stress of meal prepping over the holidays with Factor. Choose from over 35 weekly, flavor-packed, fresh, never-frozen meals that support a healthy lifestyle and meet your meal preferences, all delivered right to your door and ready in two minutes. If you need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best during the holidays, you can try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. Additionally, they have a ton of breakfast options, and an assortment of over 45 add-ons to suit various preferences and tastes. They have things like wellness boosts, refreshing beverage options like cold-pressed juices, shakes, and smoothies, which I'm really excited to try. Head to factormeals.com slash multi50 and use code multi50 to get 50% off. That's code M-U-L-T-I-5-0 at factormeals.com slash multi50 to get 50% off. This episode is sponsored by Shameless Care. Hey, listeners, you know that we talk all the time about how important it is to be aware of your health, both mentally as well as physically, and that includes your sexual health. And we know that many of you out there like having sex, and you also know how important it is to get regular comprehensive testing. And that's where our sponsor, Shameless Care, the experts in STI testing, come in. In our STI episodes, we talked about how a lot of doctors will just do this bare minimum amount of STI, STD testing, unless you specially request other things. And even then, sometimes they take some convincing. For example, the last time you went to your doctor, did they use a Q-tip to swab your throat to check for things like oral gonorrhea or chlamydia? Probably not. And a lot of doctors don't. But if you want to get the most comprehensive testing available, online from the comfort of your own home, then our sponsor Shameless Care has you covered. Not only do they check for oral infections, but also other infections that normally don't get tested, such as trichomoniasis or mycoplasma genitalium. But it gets better. With Shameless Care, you get a virtual physician consultation, unlimited questions, and free follow-up care for positive results, all from the privacy of your own home. So why wait? Visit shamelesscare.com today and use coupon code MULTI for a sizzling $30 discount at checkout. You can also click the link in the episode description. Don't settle for anything less than shameless care. Let them be your partner in embracing a sex-positive lifestyle. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is a time of year that can be really challenging for many folks. There's travel, there's decision-making about holiday plans, there's seasonal changes. 
it's quite natural to feel some sadness or anxiety around this time of year. However, therapy can be a bright spot amid all of the stress and change of this time of year. It can be something to look forward to. It can help you to feel grounded and it can help to give you the tools to manage everything that's going on. The three of us are big fans of therapy and BetterHelp makes that a lot easier for people to access from wherever they are. You just sign up, fill out some information about what you're looking for. They'll pair you with a therapist. And if that match doesn't work out, you can just request a new one. No questions asked. And the scheduling is flexible to meet your schedule. You can schedule a few weeks in advance. And if you need to change it, you can do that. Or you could say, we just want to text this week instead of doing a video call, or I just want to do a phone call this week. It's built around making it easy for you. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash multi today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash multi. Is the oil change indicator on your dashboard on? Don't worry. The experts at Firestone Complete Auto Care will help keep your car running right. Check out our selection of Pennzoil products at your local Firestone Complete Auto Care. Our expert technicians will help make sure you get the oil specifically designed for your car's particular make, model, and year. Call or make an appointment today at FirestoneCompleteAutoCare.com. Well, so I want to springboard off of all this conversation around choice because something I've seen some people struggle with, especially if it is this particular paradigm shift of opening up a closed relationship and if it's running into conflict and resistance where often the partner who's maybe more gung-ho about shifting this can really struggle with this question of, is this a super inherent intrinsic part of me that if I don't have this, I'm just going to be miserable? Or is this something that I can leave by the wayside for the sake of like maybe going back to monogamy or going back to a more familiar type of relationship. And now in the book, the two of you get into a little bit of that, the debate about, you know, oh, is non-monogamy, is it a lifestyle choice? Is it a decision? Is it an identity? Is it something that's immutable within people? And can you talk to us a little bit about that and about your own personal perspectives on that? You know, whether or not those categories are hard and fast, fixed things and human experience, is less important to me personally. I think I don't want to diminish. If someone says to me, I am ethically non-monogamous, consensually non-monogamous as an orientation, this is who I am, this is my essence, great. That's great. I have no problem with that. If someone says, this is my lifestyle, I'm choosing this out of multiple choices, but I could live with it or without it, great. That's not a thing for me in terms of that being ultimate big T truth. I think it comes back to that question of, of agency and choice. I'm most interested in what are people choosing based on their own sort of assessment of their own personal needs and wants. And so have they gone through enough experiential situations relationally to really know that about themselves and then sort of to figure that out? Like I'm much more interested in this kind of circles back to that that question of parts work. You've got a mature adult self as sort of the center where we're wanting to make decisions where we're really able to see kind of, okay, what's, what are my needs? How do I get those met? And then parts. And so we're really helping clients figure out, okay, when are you grounded in yourself, your adult self, and when are you being led or blended with a part? And so in terms of this question of what are the decisions you're making around any given particular relationship or even the kind of identity that you're taking on, if you're really anchored in your sense of self, then great. I think it, it's, it feels less important to me sort of where you're falling on that spectrum, as long as you're really feeling anchored in your connection to yourself and what's right for you in the now. Because what I've seen is I've seen people on either side of the spectrum in their own journey flip to the other. I've seen people who were devout. I am poly as orientation. This is who I am. Change and go to monogamy. And I've seen sort of the same on the other side. So for me, it feels less fixed. And I don't want to tell people they are or aren't or these things are real or aren't. I'm just really curious about where are you grounded in your own experience, lived experience now that's really going to help you make a decision that serves you. Yeah, and I think, right, that's as a practitioner, I love what you're saying, but there's also sort of the politics to this question too, that mm -hmm. so many people have found that they haven't been able to get equal rights 
unless they claim something as immutable and that it wasn't a choice. This is who I am, right? My especially sexual orientation would be the obvious example or something like my ethnicity or gender. And so therefore I have a right to human rights like everyone else. And it's interesting, right? Why can't we actually have rights, legal rights as polyamorous people if it was a lifestyle choice? The way religion actually is a protected class, which for many people is a choice. So I think there's that dimension of this question too, which is just important to at least name. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I feel like that's always, anytime we are being interviewed by some outlet or something and someone asks a question related to, is it a lifestyle choice? Is it an identity? You know, is it inherent in you? Whatever that I always want to say, why do you want to know that? Right. Because there's always that fear of like, why is it because you just need validation and you feel like if it wasn't part of my orientation, then I don't deserve to get it. Or is it about saying, well, if this isn't your orientation, then I don't have to respect it. Or, you know, it's like, where are you coming from when you ask that question? It is such a loaded one that I tend to, you know, try to avoid answering it. And we end up taking this kind of middle road of like, well, for some people, it's an orientation. For some people, it might be a choice, which is true, I suppose, but also is kind of avoiding it because it's such a problematic question in and of itself, or at least it can be. Yeah. And I love what you're saying. And I really resonate with that caution. And I see the way that then socially people are sort of positioned to make claims or sort of lean into an identity because they feel like this is the only way I'm going to get it justified or sort of see it legitimized. And then people are like less in tune with their own individual experience. And so for me, that's the really that's the sticking point is is Mm -hmm. this social construction, the thing or the the need to be legitimized, which is important and I recognize Well, what does that then mean for your own capacity to pivot when you need to? So I want to move over to the chapter that was the mostly Dave chapter, and that was on restorative relationship conversations. First, I want to talk about what that is, and then also if you want to discuss your work in restorative justice as well, I'd be really curious to talk about that. Yeah, the restorative relationship conversation model came out of my work in the field of restorative justice. And so restorative practices is sort of an umbrella term for a lot of different approaches to the usage of the concept of restorative. And so there's churches, schools, courts, hospitals, businesses even. On an institutional level, there's a lot of places where restorative practices are starting to be integrated. I think it's still on the margins, but it's definitely making sort of slight inroads into the mainstream. And so I was doing restorative justice as a bilingual case coordinator and restorative justice conference facilitator trainer for several years before creating this model, the restorative relationship conversations model. And so what I was seeing in that world was there was incredible possibilities for transformation of conflict when people had the opportunity to sit in the same space and talk about the impacts of their behavior on others and then work together to figure out, okay, what needs to be done in order to repair this harm? Where I was situated was I was working with people who were referred to our nonprofit, typically by the police. Sometimes we'd have kind of freelance cases come to us. And then instead of going to the courts and being sentenced, these people would have the opportunity to sit down with the people they've harmed and do a conference. And so it was interesting and really powerful work. But sort of at the end of the day, what I was seeing was that even though these conferences were transformative and amazing, people were still being leveraged to be in that space, right? You had sort of a choice to do our program or you're going to go to court. And so while you're probably going to learn a lot and have an amazing experience, that leverage always stuck with me. And it was something that I Mm. didn't really, it didn't land well. And so I had this experience where this principal from a local elementary school came to us It was like, would you take this case on pro bono? We had all these eight-year-olds, like six, eight-year-olds who've gotten to this huge, a really intense fight on the playground. The cops were called. No one could be arrested, thankfully, because they were under the age. But it was this small community school where the principal recognized this has to be resolved. We can't just have this tension. These families recognize, the kids recognize that something has to be done, but they didn't know what to do. So they came to us, asked us if we'd modify our process. And so we did. We modified it, changed the language. 
showed up in their gym one cold and frosty January morning with all of these kids <laughs> and parents on a weekend. And it, I was, it struck me as we were going through the circle and I'm listening to these kids and parents just be so sincere and talk about the ways that they were hurt and why they did what they did and how they wanted things to be different. I realized, like, whoa, no one is being leveraged to be here. Everyone is choosing to be here because they recognize the importance of these connections. Everyone is a deeply committed stakeholder to this situation. I was so moved by it. And everybody was like, I want to do work like this where everyone wants to be in this space, where everyone's choosing to be here. So it took a couple of years to kind of go from that breakthrough revelation to creating this model. But I realized that there was sort of a niche out there that no one was filling, no one was applying restorative principles to intimate relationships. As far as I had seen, I thought this is a great model for creating safe containers for conflict. And Lord knows people need it in these, these circumstances. That's amazing. I appreciate also in here that you shout out being able to create those safe containers and then doing it on a regular basis as well, which is something that we talk a lot about. And thank you for shouting out the radar method in the book as well. Something that you discuss there is about creating an awareness of internal and external triggers. And you have a specific exercise. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, this is really about learning how our triggers function in us. Right. And this is something that's really close to my heart because I feel like it's one of the most practical and immediate ways to start interrupting conflict cycles. And so most people have at least access to three sort of self-awareness points. Right. So it could be the story that your mind's telling you. You get triggered, you go into sort of a loop, sort of a predictable story. She doesn't love me. He doesn't care about this relationship. This is always going to be this way. If you can catch that narrative that's usually very repetitive and very singular, that can clue you in to the fact that you're triggered and you probably need to slow down and do some adjusting for your nervous system. The next is emotions. And so other people are more in touch with their emotional side. So I'm getting really upset. I'm getting really angry, really frustrated, really set, overwhelmed by sadness. What's happening for me? And then third is somatic. And so what's happening in your body? It's really interesting to see how this is typically a gendered thing for a lot of clients. A lot of men have a really hard time connecting to their emotions. They're usually the first thing that they can connect to is they're not everyone. This is a generalization, but it's what I see across the board in terms of the work that I do. It's really fascinating to see men typically can connect to their thoughts, but have a harder time connecting to their bodies and emotions. And so it's been interesting to have these different touch points for triggered awareness to help people start to clue themselves in sort of slow themselves down. Part of what I've done too is given them a one to 10 scale. It's like, okay, where are you in terms of your level of activation? If you're at a five, you're out of your prefrontal cortex. You no longer have control of your administrative functions. You're not going to have a good constructive conversation anymore. You go any further, you're down to the amygdala. You're into fight or flight responses. You got to know when you're at a five or above and you need to be doing something to pull out of the conversation. I'm so glad that you lay out that scale because, yeah, I feel like so much of not just the work that I do with clients, but also just the work that I've had to do with myself my entire life is learning, not only learning to pause when there's activation, but also learning that the cue for pausing is when you're at a three instead of when you're at a nine. Because I think that's something that, I don't know, we just lose sight of, that it's so much easier to think like, okay, when I explode, that's when it's time to pause. Or when my partner explodes, that's when it's time to pause. When it's like, no, you could probably be pausing a lot earlier. And if anything, it's it's even more of like, I think, fine-tuning that muscle to be okay with that cue coming much earlier than maybe we've been used to it coming. Totally. And there's some really interesting work to do with people in naming where they are on the attachment spectrum, right? And so for avoidance in that circumstance, they really have to be pulling, if they're pulling out early and sort of as they're recognizing sort of a three or a four, they need to really be naming that and externalizing what's happening for them and creating a very caring, compassionate, communicative exit so that their partners know what's happening. It's not just this, I'm out. This is too much. So it's really important for the avoidance or people who fall on the avoidance spectrum to really do that and be very, very explicit about that intention and naming, hey, this is for my well-being. I care about you. We're going to circle back. But I can't keep having this conversation the way it's having, sort of the way it's playing out right now. I'm going to make this exit to re-regulate. Whereas for the anxious people like myself, we have to really be aware of, okay, 
this is going to feel like potential death. I'm going to want to follow you right. If you're trying to leave this conversation while I'm feeling activation, it's going to be very, very challenging for me to let you go. And yet it's a really profound exercise and self-regulation and self-awareness to recognize, okay, this is the attachment system. My system's flooded with cortisol and whatever other neurotransmitters and, horm and hormones. I've got to let that metabolize and I'll come back after that metabolism has happened. And this is my work. And just like, a lot of deep breathing has got to happen. There needs to be a plan B. Like if a partner is going to exit and you know that's going to be hard, you have to be ready to do self-care and handle that exit well. Yeah, I'll have clients. We like do the zero to 10 and I'll call it their yellow, orange and red zones. And mm -hmm. we map out what do those zones look like, because they can look like fight, flight, or freeze, depending on which zone. And then what is self-regulation for each zone and what's co-regulation for each zone, which could be very different things. Yeah. Can you give some examples of that? Yeah. So let's just take the easier yellow zone, right? If I'm not fully triggered, but I'm starting to get activated. For me, my yellow zone, I'm going to see my thoughts start to spin. I'm arguing with someone in my head. I keep thinking about the conversation. My body feels a little tight. Whereas if I'm in my orange zone, getting closer to that like four, five, six, then I'm really distracted. I start to feel stress hormones moving, right? So, and then by that time, I'm already reacting usually in some way, like withdrawing a little bit from my partner. So in the yellow zone, it could just be me catching it and being like, oh, I'm upset. So what are my options? Well, I can... In the yellow zone, I could use breath. Breath's not going to work in my red zone, <laughs> right? I can say what's going on and name it to my partner. Say, hey, I'm activated right now. Can I have a hug? In, in that zone, something like touch, you know, rubbing my back really works very well. Naming what's going on and getting to speak about it. As I get further along, those interventions don't work as well. <laughs> and I need things that are, you know, maybe more vigorous, like running around the block or taking a break. Yeah, I want to talk about the red zone co-regulation because I think that it's like that's like the quadrant of what like so difficult where I think so many things can go awry where because you're so activated, it's really hard to even know what you want from a partner to co-regulate with you if you even want them to co-regulate with you. Yeah. And then like sometimes if you ask for the wrong thing or if your partner does the quote unquote wrong thing, it can just like spin things out even more. And so... I mean, yeah. Can you share some examples of where you've seen people? And I know this is all highly individual, but like yeah. figure things out of that that combination of being extremely activated and yet also being able to co-regulate with a partner. Yeah. So I, if both people are in the red zone, you're not going to be able to co-regulate together and really do need to take that space and maybe co-regulate with other people or you know, have your tools for what you need to do for yourself. But if we have one partner in the red and the other isn't, that's the ideal situation where they can say, come on, let's do jumping jacks to like move the hormones out. <laughs> let's get our cardio on. Like, okay. let's go for a run, punch this pillow. I'm going to hold it. Yell. Like if you can hold that space, but if it's going to traumatize you or it's directed at you, that's not mm. going to work. Right. But if yeah. your partner can actually off gas, not directed at the other one, but off gas it in front of or with the support of the other one, let's go to a rage room that can work. <laughs> Something that was said in this chapter, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, that I found to be so profound, even though it's so simple, is asking for consent from your partner to be able to talk about challenging things as opposed to just springing it on them, which I think so many people do. We just, we don't even see how they're doing. We're just like, hey, like, I'm going to talk to you right now about this thing that really pisses me off about something that you said or did. As opposed to asking, are you in a place where you can handle this conversation right now? Am I in a place where I can talk to you about it in a respectful manner? All of those things just so often don't happen. And I want like everyone to read even just that little section where you said that because it was mind blowing to me and yet made so much sense and was so simple. Yeah, it's 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 one of the most simple, as you say, but revolutionary for so many people, especially for partners yeah. who are living together and have been for so long. We just take it for granted. There's such an, a sense of entitlement to partners inner world. And it's so interesting mm -hmm. how that starts to just collapse over time. Right. This autonomy, this space, this just 
you wouldn't do that for most of your other relationships. And yet with a partner with whom you live, it's just so interesting how those boundaries start to really blur. And so consent is such a powerful word and, and you so often in the world of ethical non-monogamy or consensual non-monogamy, and yet why doesn't it cross over into process? Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about, you also have a chapter about codependency and kind of the enmeshment that we can have and how we can differentiate. And that anytime that topic comes up, it makes me think about all of these classic ways that we have to think about relationships, like the whole you complete me or two becoming one, all of these things where I think the thing we forget about when we romanticize this idea of becoming one is also this yeah, that, that autonomy or that respect for this other person might be in a different mental space than I am, but it's this like, no, 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 we're, we're like close enough that whatever, I guess to put it more negatively, whatever horrible stuff I might throw at myself, I can throw at them too. <laughs> Maybe that's a little bit dark to say it that way. Probably true though. But yeah, it's, it's like that learning how to differentiate and respect that they are this distinct, different person who does deserve that kind of respect, I think going both ways, even it can feel like you can never say no to a certain conversation or like anything a partner does, maybe even that's embarrassing in public, like you feel it for yourself because our identities become so entwined with each other. Yeah. One of the things I think is, is really connected to that phenomenon is people don't realize that they're, this goes back to that piece of self-awareness. People don't realize that they're actually trying to co-regulate. And they start processing mm. and they're just trying to go into some kind of co-regulation loop. And there's no, and that's partly why it doesn't feel good and why you do need consent. Because if that's what you're doing and you don't realize it and you're trying to draw somebody into that process, it's probably not going to feel good really to the other person. And so they're going to be like, what a minute, what's happening if they're even aware of that? But that's really the thing that I see over and over again is people are actually trying to get some kind of regulation. They're trying to off gas because they're holding the tension that they can't really, they haven't learned how to hold themselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Holding that tension that I always think about Martha Kalpi's phrase that she uses in her fantastic book about that muscle of holding steady, which it kind of goes both ways in that dynamic that if you're the person who, you know, your partner stepped on your toes in some way, or maybe you're more anxious attached and you are kind of trying to seek a little bit of that comfort and reassurance of, yeah, like you were saying, David, it's like developing that sense to hold steady if it's not the right moment or if your partner's not ready to co-regulate with you or process with you what happened. And then same thing on the other side, that if you are ready to go through that process with a partner, having to hold steady through realizing like, yeah, I'm going to have to sit with my partner, maybe saying that I hurt them in some way. Right. Or like expressing feelings that maybe I had no intention whatsoever of producing in them and having to hold steady and like hold that and hear that without immediately jumping to the defensive or throwing it back in their face. So, yeah, it feels like those are similar muscles to me. And it's so much easier to talk about this stuff than to do this stuff. <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. What I wanted to jump back to this when you all were talking about that piece around co-regulation, sort of when people are activated and how to co-regulate in the different zones, right? And one of the things that can help a lot of partners is to have sort of a contingency plan and talk about what actually does work when you are that activated. Because a lot of people don't realize that the thing that they're doing makes things worse. And so what I want for partners is to actually have a good roadmap for what is actually going to give their partner's nervous system the kind of soothing and support that it needs in those moments when activation is happening. And so if we can do that when people are not triggered and practice that, like literally practice it so that their nervous systems have a chance to feel that flow together and they're in the same agreement created in the therapeutic space, it often creates a lot more sense of safety because a lot of people try to verbalize sort of talk things out when often what they're needing is something somatic or vice versa. So I really want partners to really know what's going to be the strategy that's actually going to work for that kind of co-regulation. For listeners, Deb Dana's work, she applies polyvagal theory to like, what are the interventions that you need if you're in that sympathetic dominance, you know, or if you're in that dorsal vagal shutdown so I would recommend people check out. I think it's befriending your nervous system. Well, I so, so highly recommend this book. Again, I think, as I've said in the little blurb that I wrote for you all, 
this book is really about moving into 401 territory in terms of polyamory. There's so many books out there that are really 101. And this just goes above and beyond into really how to become polywise, as you said in the book, and move past the changes that happen when you are just starting out becoming polyamorous. So thank you so much for your work in this book. It's been a pleasure to read it again. And where can people find more of both of you and your work? Yeah, for me, they can find me at jessicafern.com. They can find me at restorativerelationship.com. I'm assuming that has links to buy the books and all that stuff there as well as work with you. Yep, exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for being here. Our question of the week, which is going to be on our Instagram stories, is what is your definition of being polywise? We're very interested to see what you all have to say to that. And the best place to share your thoughts with other listeners is in the episode discussion channel in our Discord server, or you can post in our private Facebook group. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to multiamory.com slash join. In addition, you can share with us publicly on X, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all of the above. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowork and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 